So good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. We have had an enormous response to this program and we just appreciate um, the conversation that we're going to have. I just wanted to begin by saying a few names. Rihanna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, George Floyd, David McAtney. Unfortunately, for years, this list has grown week by week. These names represent lives that matter. Black lives matter. Thank you all for being here today to talk about a timely and an extremely relevant conversation regarding justice for Black lives. This week, the CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, Jill Savitt, released a statement. And we invite her to read that statement now. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks to all of you for joining us today and especially to our panelists who you'll meet in just a moment. We gather against a backdrop of pain and injustice in our country. The proximate cause is the murder of George Floyd and other black men and women by vigilantes and law enforcement. This despair is showing itself in protests because of a lack of justice and accountability. The despair we see is about George Floyd, but also because this injustice is not new. It is part of a system that's been in place even since before the founding of our country. The coronavirus is just one more stark reminder of how this injustice manifests. The individual deaths and the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on African Americans, on immigrants and poor people makes it deadly clear that one's rights, health, and security in America is largely determined by race and income. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. Democracy is supposed to recognize everyone is equal before the law, that we, were, we are all born with rights and dignity that our government and our law enforcement officials are obligated to protect. Our democracy is broken. The question is, what do we do? Can we change this dangerous path we are on? The simple answer is yes, because there's no other option. We can and we must. And we know how. The exhibitions in our center tell the story of how committed individuals transformed our country at a moment in time, ending segregation under the law and securing the right of African Americans to vote. We also show how advocates around the world are raging campaigns for freedom today. People like the protesters out on the streets and the front lines right now. Protection of human rights provides a way forward, but only if we act. Change will only come when we, we the people, all of us demand it. This week, the center launched a campaign, the Campaign for Equal Dignity. Our goal is to galvanize people you, me, your friends and family, and their friends and their family to demand equality for all. You can go to equaldignity.org to sign up. The campaign will feature programs like this one, ideas about actions to take, and advocacy training. As I close, I want to offer a word to my fellow white people. George Floyd was killed because he was black. The same is true for all the other people Nicole named. All of their killers were white. White people have a special responsibility right now to demand justice. Our black colleagues, friends, and neighbors are tired of doing this work alone. We need to stand together as human beings and people of conscience, and we need to help them to work for justice. As Dr. King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. The division and inequality in our country will not be solved overnight, but I guarantee you it won't be solved at all unless we act together to reanimate our human rights values, our national values of a government by the people, for the people that demands the promise of equality and justice that is made real for everyone. Thanks again for joining us today, and I really look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Jill. This weekend, this year, 
this decade, it has been a lot. We just wanna have an open conversation on the murders of black men and women at the hands of law enforcement and vigilantes and the impact of this violence on the black community, both mentally and physically. The frustration that's felt in communities of color regarding police violence against black and brown bodies has rocked our nation once again. And we all have a role to play in calling out injustice and creating change in our systems. As we ask the public to encourage elected leaders to advance health security, access to quality education, voting rights and economic stability in our campaign for equal dignity, it is the fifth tenement, justice for all, that requires our immediate attention. Fighting for justice includes fighting against abuse by law enforcement, as a long list of unarmed black victims has made very clear. Today, we are very fortunate to have four individuals whose perspectives are invaluable to this conversation. Our facilitator is Adria Kitchens. Adria has supported women in transforming their lives for over a decade. She specializes in working with self-actualizing women, executives, experienced coaches, therapists, local and global leaders. She is a graduate of John Hopkins University, a certified cultural competency facilitator, and a certified feminine power coach and facilitator specializing in women's transformational leadership. She is currently the Equitable Dinners Atlanta Programs Manager, leading a network of impassioned leaders to connect our communities, bring awareness to inequalities, and activate anti-racist action. We are so happy to have her here. Our panelists include Allison Bantingo, a Massachusetts, a Massachusetts native. Allison has called Atlanta home for the past four years. She's joined the National Center for Civil and Human Rights as the campaign manager for Truth and Transformation. And she has also organized the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative. The FCRC works to engage Fulton County in a process of truth and reconciliation by confronting our history of racial terrorism and recognizing its legacy. Allison, thank you for being here. Janetta Netta Elzey is a writer, protester, and organizer. She's a St. Louis native who has become known for her on and offline activism and organization uh, and organizing during the Ferguson uprising of 2014. In the years since, she has worked to organize towards sustainable change. In 2015, she sat on the planning team for both mappingpoliceviolence.org and we the protesters.org which provide police accountability and organizer resources. That same year, she helped launch Campaign Zero, which is a comprehensive policy platform to address police violence in the United States. Elsie believes Michael Brown and the uprising in Ferguson forever changed her life. Her writing has been published widely, including Teen Vogue, Ebony, and Anxi Mag. And in 2016, she graced the cover of Essence Magazine's February 2016 Black Girl Magic issue. Today, she is a content partner at While at Home, which is a site dedicated to providing real-time resources and information on the coronavirus. Janetta, thank you for being here. Thank you. Our last panelist is Andre Dickens. He is a city councilman, businessman, nonprofit executive, engineer, and native Atlanta. His career follows his passion and his impact follows his commitment. Councilman Dickens was elected citywide to the Atlanta City Council Post 3 at Large in November of 2013. And as the Post 3 at Large Council member, he is a vocal and legislative leader on educational opportunities for Atlanta public school students, affordable housing, transportation, workforce development, and senior citizens programming. Mr. Dickens created the Department of Transportation's $15 per hour minimum wage the Beltline Inclusionary Zoning for Affordable Housing, the Atlanta Youth Commission, the $40 million Housing Opportunity Board, and the Joint Commission between City Council and Atlanta Public School Board. He has done so much for our community, and we very much appreciate his time being here. Thank you for joining us. And with that, I am going to turn the conversation over to Adria. Well, hello, everyone. So great to be here. Definitely great to be here with a native Atlantan all about the Falcons and the Braves and the Hawks, right? <laughs> uh, indeed, wonderful. So um, I just wanna first just give us all like permission just to take a collective breath, to acknowledge all that's happening 
in our cities um, and other cities across the nation, across our world. Right. <sighs> just to take a big breath and just give space for the pain and the anxiety that we feel. And really, I just want to honor as well the presence and the power of our collective wisdom and the collective wisdom of our panelists, amazing panelists today uh, as we come together. So, um, so it's an honor to be here. And I just want to ask our yeah. panelists, you know, so who or what is supporting you right now to navigate what's happening in our world? Leave first. <laughs> uh, everybody don't don't start at once um yeah. helping me navigate i think it's just uh my comrades literally just them my friends my family um in 2020 my family is way more supportive than they were in 2014 when we first went outside so um that's very reassuring and you know just black love being in love Black love, loving our families, our friends. Um, I feel very, very supported right now. So that makes a whole, that makes such a, a difference. Thank you, Nita. Yeah, I think my, my support system is my family and my friends. Um, and just knowing that I'm, I'm continually working um, or creating things and, and making things happen that can last after these protests um, kind of invigorate everybody and, and get people um, called to this work. So, yeah, that's my support. <laughs> For me, um, you know, it's, it's just crazy busy right now. Lots of things to do, right? All the calls, all of the protests, all of the um, meetings, the back, the back side meetings, the front side meetings, just trying to figure out all this stuff. So Wusa, you know, trying to just take it easy. Um, and 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 the the God's honest truth is, I'll tell you something that I normally, whenever there's trouble in Atlanta, I used to be on the board of the Center for Civil Civil and Human Rights, and I'm a lifetime member. I would actually walk through the center sometimes when conflict will happen. I would, and I'm not just you know, uh, playing to the home crowd here. I'm telling the truth. This is what I would do. I would center myself. I'd read like a few books or read the alchemist or some other things and kind of get myself kind of like looking at what the future holds. And, um, but you know, right now, because we're in a coronavirus, you can't do some of those things. So I've been turning internally, talking to God about it, talking to myself um, and talking to my family and friends about this. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I get a whole lot of calls and texts from uh, allies saying, what can I do? I see you. I feel your pain. I had to tell them, let me take a day off. Y'all, y'all giving me homework right after I just, we, we just came out of a really <laughs> tough week. They like, I'm like, you know, get, get, you know, give us a break a little bit. I'll give you some one, two, three, four plan uh, in a little bit, but uh, <laughs> what's going on? I don't know about y'all, your allies call you saying, what can I do? Yes, what can I do? Yes. I'm, like, hey, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to breathe, but I'm not trying to educate you today. Let me catch up on the for a second. <laughs> oh, I love that you said that. Yes, because that, that has definitely been happening. And I really so appreciate, I so appreciate that. Like, just let me take a breath. You know, mm -hmm. Let us all just take a breath before we start the next step, right? Yeah. So we can get together. So, um, well, beautiful. So, Netta, can I, can I ask you a question? Um, because you are right, you, you were on the ground in Ferguson. You're saying all this happening today. Um, you've been in the energy of peaceful protest. You're saying that you know you've experienced the other side of it, violent protests. Um, can you give us some insight into that and kind of your sense of what's happening and what that was so, like? So um, we've been. I've, I'm in D.C. actually, so I've been going to the White House for the last three or four days. Um, and even with that, so I, I personally don't classify protest as peaceful or violent. I feel like that plays into a lot of respectability politics. And what we learned in Ferguson is we don't have time for any of that. I'm not here or interested in showing or showcasing to white people. Look at us. We're not savages. We can 
walk and march and sing and all of that. Like, that's not what I'm here for. Um, and I believe my hometown of St. Louis really got, we got results, we got action, um, we got notice from just being our authentic selves, however we showed up at the protest. So I actually told this reporter yesterday, I'm not interested in policing protesters. That is the most insane thing. You know, imagine going to a protest about the police to police other people, that's wild. So for me, the difference between now and Ferguson in 2014, I would say is just even more militarization of the police. That's why I go to the protest to watch. I don't go to watch what we're doing. Um, I see and observe everything, of course, but I'm watching the police and how they're escalating and when they're choosing to escalate, how they're kettling people, um, when they choose to, who they're choosing to escalate violence with, watching them literally, you know, handpick out white people to not violate and then taking the next black body that's next to them. Like that's what we've been literally seeing. Wow. So um, for me, I would say the police have definitely escalated more. They definitely have more approval to do so from um, head leadership of this country. Um, and yeah, so I, it's, it's very hard for me to say what the difference is. Um, there is no real difference except for more escalation. Right. But forces outside of, outside of ourselves. Right. Wow. Wow. So you were just talking when we came on that you were, were you out protesting yesterday? Um, we went, not yesterday, what is today? Wednesday, yes. so not Tuesday, <laughs> Monday, Sunday, Saturday, Friday, and I mm -hmm. think Thursday, not sure. Mm -hmm. And what's the sense of the, if we get the protesters view, what's going on with them? Uh, I'm gonna try to watch my language. So, <laughs> I mean, everyone is just really pissed off and it's a lot of kids outside. That's what definitely makes me wanna keep going. Um, you can see that they're super young. My sister at home it just turned 20. So she still even has that baby face. It's a lot of baby faces outside, um, 17, 18, 19. And you could hear them say across um, racial lines, especially like, I feel like I have no hope. This place has nothing for me. Like if we're saying millennials, we're, you know, so bad off because of what generations before us did, imagine how these kids feel. So that's just what it is. You just feel a lot of pain and a lot of despair. Um, I wouldn't say hopeless um, because they make me hopeful, just the fact that they're even outside and that they're so, um, you know, they're using their anger in good ways, if you ask me. So I appreciate them even just showing up and I think as adults and especially grown folks, our job is to show up and support them. Beautiful, Thank you, thank you, Netta. I also wanna open it up to Andre or Allison if you wanted to share uh, any of your insights on the protests and, and what's happening uh, in our cities right now. Um, I'd echo Netta and I'm, I'm hopeful by seeing how many faces and how many bodies are out um, in the streets and out um, actively seeking ways to change what's happening. Um, it's, I'm consistently terrified by how militarized and how quickly we can escalate, how quickly they have the ability to escalate into a full um, like military force. Um, but it is super inspiring to see so many young people out there and it, it, like right in the faces of these armed guards. Yeah, I mean, I'll just e echo that as well. I mean, I, but, but first let me just say that what has happened to George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on and on and on is murder. It's um, it's, it's murder by the hands of uh, police authorities. And so, um, and even cases here in Atlanta, DeAndre Phillips, Jimmy Atchison, um, you know, I, I, I will talk more about, you know, how Atlanta has a civil rights history and a role to play in uh, making sure we right wrongs, but we're not perfect. So in our imperfection, with all, with all eyes 
on us as well as other cities. Even Atlanta had a tasing of two college students um, as they you know, were out 30 minutes past curfew. Uh, curfew started at nine o'clock. They were out at, you know, just trying to drive through and excessive force. And, you know, we fired them, uh, those officers the next day, but more to come. Six were arrested yesterday. So I would say um, I am thankful that protesters are out protesting and how they're doing it. Um, I, I, I agree with Netta in the sense of there's, there's, it's, it, it is difficult to try to draw a line between putting words to it like peaceful and unpeaceful and all that stuff. Um, uh, they were organized or disorganized, but their voices were heard and still being heard. And unfortunately, right with the all eyes, all cameras on us, it still, even still showed how excessive force can happen when, when you're no better, when you're told, don't mess up this time. And it still happens. So, um, you know, I respect and appreciate the protests. And I do like to see all the faces out there, the different races, the different backgrounds, different age groups, um, everybody standing in solidarity. Um, but I also know that there are some people infiltrating and hiding in the shadows to do dirt, to do wrong, to be opportunistic. So I um, just wanted to raise that as well. But that, that doesn't mean stop the fight. That means stop those that mean to do the, the, the protests some harm, call them out and keep on doing what we need to do to bring about justice. That's what it's about. Mm, you know, I'm so glad that you shared that. And, um, you know, a great segue as we think about who you are, right, as a Black man. I think about my, my, my youngest, my son is 19, he's 6'2", with locks, you know, and I'm constantly like, you know, when you go out, don't do this, don't do that. And so how do you, as a Black man in a position of political power here in Atlanta, you know, you talked about we're in the middle of, of Atlanta, cradle of the civil rights movement. How do you navigate both those worlds, uh, being an elected official and looking out for all of your constituents and being, you know, a Black man in America? Woo, word. So I am a, I'm an Atlanta native. I'm a Black man. I'm a father. Um, I'm a son, a brother to my sister. I'm a pretty, uh, pretty dope uncle. Uncle Dre is the favorite uncle of all, everybody. Um, I'm also a Christian, and those lenses are how I see the world. Um, I became a city councilman uh, and you know an engineer later in my life, and so that does help me understand the systems. It helps me understand the budgets and policies and those sort of things. Um, and I'm an at-large city council member, which means I represent the whole city of Atlanta. That means the black, the white, the wealthy, the poor, north and south. But make no mistakes about it. For me, I see the world through the lens of an African-American man. I, you said your son is 6'2". I'm 6'3". Um, and so, you know, it, I'm unashamed and unafraid to communicate that I am not colorblind. I see the world, uh, you know, I see colors in everybody as a well-traveled well individual. I see the distinctions and differences in people and I see it as beautiful. Um, and I see the world as the way that it presents itself. So um, therefore I see the implicit biases, prejudices, um, racism, et cetera, and how the world and the individuals in the world presents themselves, the preferences that they have. Even in a city that, D that our DNA is civil rights, mm -hmm. our city and state, we still have a tale of two cities. There's a affluent and a poor, there's a heard and an unheard at times. And so, you know, um, it's time, you know, we, uh, my job is to help bring about how to help people go from survival to stability on to success, to have some mobility. But we are a city that has a lot of income immobility. We're number one in the nation for income immobility. And I like to say that Atlanta is great. It's my hometown. I represent it. But we got work to do. And I think that other cities, other states have work to do. And when you admit that, then you work on it. And so um, I'm 45 years old now. And I remember growing up in this city in the working class community of Atlanta, first generation college student for myself. And so when I got an opportunity to have access to diverse friend groups and, and, and ideas and stuff, I still shared my perspective from who I was, who I am as an African-American male. So in Atlanta, you can have, you can be your authentic black self and still work, dialogue, exchange, 
with your non-black friends. I live in a, a house that was built in 1956 by a black builder and a black architect in a historically black neighborhood at Collier Heights. And I, I wanna get to the, uh, some stuff talking about economic differences in Atlanta because in other places, why the tale of two cities where we have to have fair exchange. I mean, we, we in our city, we can, I have a black realtor, a black loan officer, black arch, a black uh, contractor, uh, a right. real estate attorney. Um, so in our city, I promote that we have, you know, we have opportunities for everyone and we have to foster those. And then, but then when we go wrong, when we do wrong, we have to call it out and deal with it. And I, you know, I know there's listeners and people watching from all over the nation. Um, I like to tell you that my city is great. We're wonderful. I'm, I'm here to stand up for it, but also we got things to fix. And that's why we, um, that's why I signed up for this. And that's why the Center for Civil and Human Rights is in the middle of the city to help with that. Yeah, yeah. I love that perspective because there has to be a perspective on repair. We, we can't just act like we always get it right. Um, and when we're wrong, we need to say that and speak the truth and, and do yeah. something to repair that. Oh, one, go ahead. One, one thing I forgot to say was even in, in, with our policing situation, one thing that has helped us be good, even though we've made mistakes, is our police force reflects the population. It's a lot of black officers, a lot of officers, LGBTQ background, a lot of officers from various um, demographics, Hispanic, et cetera. So it helps to reflect the population. We go through more sensitivity training and, 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 and bias training uh, as, a, uh, as a police force than most of our um, you know, contemporaries across the nation, most of our peers. But again, even with all that training, training that they get at the King Center, training that they get at the Center for Civil and Human Rights, training they get all, it still plays out the human nature, the implicit bias by white and black cops. So, um, but I think we're on, we're, we're trying. And that's the thing um, in the city of Atlanta. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that in. I was going to ask you your perspective on that. Um, you know, there, the, because the incident the other night with the college students, those were black officers. And right. Right, right. And so you see that it, the, it's systemic, right? It continues to play out regardless uh, of race. And I'm wondering if, if Ned or Allison, if you all want to share a little bit your perspective here. On um, Black officers um, inflicting, I think that it, there's a system um, that has created who officers are. Um, and though we are have this idea that officers are here to provide and protect and do this for our community. They are a almost impenetrable force and they are unioned up and have all these things. And um, it's, I think that the, these implicit biases are systemic. They're not, they're, it's not on an individual basis. Yeah. It's not just because I'm black and have had the black experience then when I'm, out in the streets and I see somebody grab something because I'm black, I know that they're not grabbing a gun. When you are indoctrinated into this system that um, advances violence, that uh, accepts violence, that hides it, that does all these horrible things, it's, it, you're a part of the system and it's, you can't really take out yourself as an individual. All right, all right. Um, I'll say, especially as we've been seeing in D.C., where the population of police is actually a higher percentage of Black officers, um, maybe like two nights ago, right in front of the White House, next to Old Ebbets, um, there was a bit of a standoff with where the police literally just sent out only Black officers to come deal with the protesters. So that was a bit of a different um, that brought a whole different element really quick. Um, it was unexpected. They were like drawing the line um, to move us back. And then out of nowhere, we just see all these black cops come out of nowhere. And they didn't have their helmets on or their shields on at first, but once people started uh, <laughs> just talking and yelling and shouting and screaming at them, um, you know, asking them, have they no shame? Do you feel nothing that you're doing this to people who look like you? 
you saw like, you know, shields coming down when the phones, our phones are already out. But once we started zooming in and they could tell we were like looking directly at them, you could tell people like were trying to cover their faces, just mm-hmm. embarrassed. Um, and they should be, they should be extremely ashamed um, for being out in the streets, terrorizing and causing, ca- causing harm to their own people. Um, in that way. I've seen folks on Twitter, on Facebook, I have family myself who have quit the force in recent days because of everything that's happening. So this is a conscious decision to keep going out and brutalizing um, citizens, uh, folks who are undocumented, whoever is outside, everyone is outside. And you're making a choice to come and brutalize people instead of just making a choice to stand against the system that brutalizes you, whether you have your uniform on or not. Especially in St. Louis, we deal a lot with um, undercover black officers who show up at police at protests who also get beat up. You know, there's a undercover black officer who is suing the city of St. Louis right now because he got beat up so bad at, a, I believe, the Jason Stokely protest a few years mm-hmm. ago. Um, and even after he identified himself, they kept beating him. So mm-hmm. it's just like, you know, you have so many instances of stuff like this happening to where when the conflict is happening in the streets, you have no choice but to call it out because it's so obvious. It's, you know, blue lives matter until your skin is still black. And then also like we see with the students at, at the AUC, um, those black officers were given up immediately. How quick were they arrested? And there was only one off, one white officer in the mix. Now, if that was six white officers, I absolutely refuse that it would have been so fast that they would have been let go, that it would have been, you know, desk duty or something like that. But because they were black, it's immediate action, immediate consequence for what they decided to do. So um, that's my thought. Wow, wow. No, thank you. Because I mean, you're really talking about that tension. Um, so if I could add. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Al. Yes, I also think that there's a, a lot of times people join the police force with this idea of changing things from the inside. But this system, like I was saying, is so is so strong that that it, it I, it's apparent that it changes you before you can change it. And, and it there needs to be more systemic change. Yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I think a great segue because uh, Netta was talking about the, you know, terrorizing our communities. And Allison, you founded the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition, you know, in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative, really to talk about this process, right, of reconciliation and to really talk about the racial terror that has been um, enacted upon our communities for so, so many years. And, um, and I know that you all have already uh, collected soil samples and documented at least 35 racial terror lynchings. And you've done work on the Atlanta massacre of 1906. Um, so I just wanna see how do you draw the direct line, which I think we're already seeing <laughs> from the past to the present. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, nationwide it's, it's very clear um, and Brian Stevenson says this, it's, it's outlined in the 1619 Project and in so many other um, scholarly works there, that slavery evolved, it didn't, it didn't end. Um, we, you can see this natural progression through Jim Crow, through um, lin- the era of lynching, through segregation, through the um, crack academic and war on drugs. Um, through mass incarceration that we are continually to continually um, enslaving and abusing black bodies. Um, but here in Atlanta, and, and I say this knowing that I am not a, a native Atlantan, um, so, and I do also love the city, so, um, but we, 114 years ago, there was a riot in downtown Atlanta. Um, And it's still officially called a riot. We call it a massacre um, because almost um, up to 10,000 white men descended upon the city um, into a predominantly black area and murdered and slaughtered at least 25 um, black men and women. Um, And at that time in Jim Crow law, 
black men um, or black people were not allowed to arm themselves. So there was no um, defending themselves. And when they did defend themselves, they were arrested or killed because they were um, owning guns to simply defend themselves from white mobs. Um, and we don't learn about that in Atlanta. Uh, it's in 2007, it was added to the curriculum. Uh, for eighth grade history. So it's it's fairly new, newly taught to students. Um, and it's two or three days of, uh, or, or less of um, education. And we also leave out the fact that what the city's response to it was to maintain this image of being, um, and even pre Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, we were still this city too busy to hate. That phrase comes out of the response to the um, to this massacre. Uh, almost a few days after the newspapers say that it all is quiet in Atlanta, she's back to normal. And it was like, it never happened. Um, and it was end, it was four days of violence ended after ended because it was starting to inflict too much um, damage to businesses and property. And we're seeing that exact same language right now. People are defending property over people. Um, and it's, it's that capitalism that is that has maintained racism that's rooted in white supremacy that we are seeing today that is is really no different than this massacre that happened 115 years ago. So when you draw that line in terms of uh, us talking about the Atlanta massacre and really bringing that forward and, you know, I know you've had a push to like change the name, like really to, to bring that forward in what we're doing today. Um, where are you all with that and, and how do you see us being able to support you in doing and getting that change? Um, so well, in the whole project, so the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition is working on a community remembrance project in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative to recognize this legacy of racial terror. And um, so we can start this truth telling process and begin the healing process. Um, and I mean, that takes a very long time. We have started identifying and are doing remembrance um, initiatives for um, 35 of the 36 documented victims in Fulton County, um, but 25 of whom are victims of the Atlanta massacre. Um, and we have just unofficially kind of changed the name. Um, I know at pre-COVID, uh, the center had plans to officially launch um, a campaign to change the name um, across the board to a massacre because it, it it was a massacre it was not a riot um but we just it, it's kind of at this point word of mouth i just will not re refer to it as a riot um i correct people when when they refer to it as a riot and and keep going that way until we can get some real change mm, thank you thank you allison so i just want to invite our other panelists uh netta or andre to share, um, I think, great segue from Allison, like how do we, what can we do now, right, with the system that we really seek to change? What are the ways that we can act and, and make a difference? You're muted. Um, I was gonna see if Netta wanted to go, but, you know, one, we have to call out injustice each and every time. Um, can't take days off, can't break. Um, for across the nation, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, uh, as Dr. King said. So one is being um, being aware, being vocal about what you're aware of. of. So I think now um, I'm seeing on social media people posting uh, lots of things that continue to inform folks. You know, read this book, watch this uh, documentary. So I think there's some awareness that can help some people that just have been frankly unaware. Um, and there are, you know, there was uh, Obama's 21st uh, century policing laws that need to be looked at if they're not done in the cities. And I'm looking at some of them. We did about half in 2016, 2017. And that was about as much political will was there at that time to get half done. And now it's time to look at doing more. Um, and, and to, you know, for citizens to continue to push us as legislators, as leaders to do more, 
to pay attention more um, and for us to search ourselves to do more. The other thing I'll say is um, economics. Economics is important um, too. It's important to get the policy right. It's important to break down uh, negative destructive systems um, uh, and have criminal justice reform. But I also believe in the economics, black economics, particularly for me. Um, I, yes, I managed the budget of an entire city. So it's more than just, you know, one race. But I also, I mean, I, you know, I'm unashamed of being able to say um, we, we have um, black money goes in multiple directions, but all the other money doesn't come back in our direction a lot of times. So the black restaurant, the black dry cleaners, the black, um, you know, shop, uh, the black t-shirt printer, <laughs> you know, the black business, um, their customers end up being predominantly black and individuals don't come back that way. Um, so we don't have a, 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 a unilateral, a multilateral um, exchange, a transfer of income and economics in general. And so what you see is you got to have equity <clears throat> either in the beginning or it's going to cost you even more in the end. Yeah. Equity got a price to pay. So either you're going to recruit and train, you know, minorities to be a part of your, a, a part of the businesses and the, uh, the organizations, or it's going to cost you in the end where people are going to protest, kind of challenge this or, or boycott back off of your, your, your businesses and, and um, not participate. You could have riots, you could have protests, you could have all of that. So I think we need to have um, economics play a big part in this, in our discussions with Blacks and with non-Blacks. Non um, and, then, and then communication is key. Spreading the word, um, being able to share the influencers, the individuals with a microphone, everybody um, that's got a voice should use it, to, should share it. And um, that means, you know, minorities, I mean, allies, that means everybody all, all together. Um, you know, and I, and I think, um, you know, there's so many more tactics, but, um, you know, we can keep, uh, you know, we did ban the box here in Atlanta. We did, I did minimum wage, $15 an hour um, for, for, you know, we got youth programs, but we can do so much more. And I think, Allowing people to feel empowered to contribute in their own way, that you don't have to boil the ocean, as we say, that one person ain't got to come up with a master plan for the whole you know, issue of racism or the whole issue of police brutality or the whole issue of you know, prejudice. I think that all of us using our own individual platforms and elevating that voice to the magnitude that it can and being and constantly sharing it, and, you know, I think that that will um, go a long ways, um, you know, in our, in our pursuits. Thank you, Andre. Nada, did you want to share? Can you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah, I was just, uh, no, you're fine. I was just asking like recommendations for some things that we can do next. Was oh, really, so, what are those steps? Okay. Mm -hmm. I love solutions. So um, I definitely feel that if you haven't been introduced to join campaignzero.org, you should go. I am a co-founder. I'm a co-founder of joincampaignzero.org, um, which I f we founded with um, DeRay McKesson, Brittany Pecknett, Sam Sinyangwe. Uh, we founded this, I feel like in 2016, 2015. Um, it's a 10-point policy plan on ending police violence. So that includes ending broken windows policing, um, introducing more community oversight, including um, independent in investigations and prosecutions. Um, body camera and filming the police trainings and especially one that's so important to me demilitarizing the police um, for me solutions include divesting from policing um, spending more of that money and investing it into communities um, into especially in places like st louis i saw footage last night in the two for the last two nights seeing how much money st louis city puts into militarizing our police in the county and in the city when school kids in the city don't have books, 30, 40 kids a classroom. And that goes for so many cities across the country that is pitiful, it's pathetic. It's a direct reflection of our leadership, um, of the, the city mayor, the city county managers, 
um, the governor, anyone who's in a leadership position, this is all falling on your hands. I also feel that home uh, people who are without homes need um, shelter. They need options of places to stay, especially during a pandemic. Um, I'm not exactly sure. <sighs> you know, I, it's been blowing my mind that we've seen this country respond so fast to Black people coming outside. Because when white people were outside protesting for the right to go outside, it was no problem. AR-15s everywhere, no problem. Nobody batted an eye, moved an inch. Police just sat there with their own face masks on um, while other white people yelled at the white police officers. But when black people stepped outside, the whole country got militarized, which we saw happen in Ferguson. So that's why I'm so staunchly serious about demilitarizing the police. We have seen what they can do. Um, I've seen the police tear gas children, small kids in strollers age of two and younger in St. Louis and then I came here to DC and I saw President Trump and his police do even worse. Um, I think even for the folks who feel that they are safe inside they have a false sense of safety that is not true. The military is on the streets in our neighborhood and that is not okay. Also imagine exactly how our militaries are when they are overseas and let's factor in some solidarity across the globe. Um, we should be alarmed that our, that our military and our police can mobilize against us, but also keep in mind how our military mobilizes against other black and brown people across the globe. Thank you. Well said, Nana, thank you so much. So just as a last question, what, what gives you all hope? Like in just a laser chair, where do you find hope? Um, well, I kind of, I want to add to your previous question uh, oh, sure. about what we can do. I think I've been seeing a lot of kind of arguments about what's the best thing to do. And, and, and you, if you're not out on the streets, then you're not doing anything. And if you're not doing this and you only gave $10 and all this stuff, I think that we need to stay focused on what the issue is and support everybody doing everything to the best of their ability. Um, I would encourage people meeting their capacity and going a little past their capacity, getting a little bit uncomfortable and doing whatever they can um, and, and getting involved in any way. Um, I, I think that defunding and deinvesting in the police is an utmost importance. I think getting um, educated, and that does not mean calling your black friends and asking what's going on, that means, um, <laughs> finding the right Twitter accounts to follow, not trusting just one news source, um, learning where your taxes go, knowing how much of your taxes go to the militarization of the police, um, knowing that we are paying for these people to, to stand against us right now, um, will might incentivize you a bit more to do a little bit, um, but just continually get educated and, and uplift the ones who who have the capacity to to educate our allies and 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 um, not shame the ones who don't have the capacity and uplift them in other ways. Um, but I think that we need to remember that as Black people, we are we are united by our skin color because that is what our opposition is seeing, um, and and we have to we have to. Uh, remain vigilant even after these protests die down and remain engaged and, and support people like Netta who are actively protesting from 2014 to 2020 um, and, and make sure that, 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 that we have this um, support within our community and, and coming in from the outside as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I think, I know we're going to head into some questions. So like a one to two word <laughs> that represents your hope like hope that you at this time that you find. Ooh, I was gonna say more than one or two words, but uh <laughs> <laughs> you are that's okay. <laughs> Real quick, I was gonna say we're gonna close our city jail and we're gonna make it a place of 
uh, for, for social resources, for people without homes, for people experiencing mental challenges. So that money, millions of dollars, that once upon a time was $33 million in our budget, we're bringing that down. So that's one thing. Um, but voting, we need to vote and fight voter suppression. Can't just vote. We can't tell young people just vote and at the same time allow voter suppression to happen. Mm -hmm. We got to do both and. Um, and what gives me hope, I'm a, I'm a believer, I'm optimistic, I believe in God, I believe joy comes in the morning, I believe we're going to get through this, but we're going to have to fight to get through it. We're going to have to do this together as one community. Um, so I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and um, yeah, that's it. Mm, I try you. to say it in one word, but that ain't going to work. That's, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Netta? Uh, my great grandma just used to always say, just keep living, baby. And so that's what <laughs> I'm going to do. I just keep living. That's it every day. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. My, my breath gives me hope. I'm breathing right now and I'm, I'm capable of, of continuing to do work. So until that changes, I'm, I'm hopeful. Thank you. Thank you. So I know we have some questions from the community. And um, Nicole, are you I'm here? Back. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that we got um, is for Allison, and that is, are we making an effort to bring the monument from, Gum from Montgomery at um, the lynching memorial back to Fulton County? Um, yes, so the, uh, the Community Remembrance Project is um, made up of three parts, and the last piece is, um, will culminate in, in claiming the monument um, with the 30 five and, and hopefully 30, um, we'll have 36 names etched in it. Um, right now we've completed, aside from one soil collection, um, but we've done soil collections which are on display at the Auburn App Research Library um, for 35 of the 36 individuals. Uh, we are beginning our historical marker um, project um, and we will be installing at least eight markers around the city. So you would like to join us and you can go on fullinremembrance.org to figure out how to get looped in into that um, and then we'll um, begin the work to claim that monument. Thank you. Um, for Council Member Dickens, someone asked how can they request for a virtual town hall with Atlanta citizens and elected officials? Let's do it. We, we've had one before. We can keep having them. So um, my, my just send me an email, whoever that is, or drop it in the chat. Uh, it's a Dickens at atlantaga.gov. A Dickens at Atlanta GA would love to do one. Um, or Andre for Atlanta, Andre for Atlanta. You can hit me up. But yeah, we'd love to. We need to do more of them. We we um we're in the middle of our budget season right now, so we are having town halls to discuss the budget and removing money from the budget for the uh, for the jail. Uh, but yeah, let's 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 have one. Send me whoever that was, send me the information. Uh, um, whoever wrote my thing in here, this would be a Dickens at atlantaga.gov. Uh, there you go, thank you. Um, another question, and this is for everyone in general, but um, probably um, Netta, who's done a lot of, a lot of this work, what is the best way to confirm and verify that when people donate, their sort their money and their donations are going to the proper places? <laughs> I would, oh goodness, um, literally, mm, I send people links directly to real people that I know in the cities um, where uprisings are happening. So I follow maybe like a thousand people on Twitter. Most of those people are still the folks I followed before 2014. So they've been all wondering like, who do we donate to? Who do we donate to? And I just send them literally city by city. Here are the links uh, that I can verify myself, that I will vouch myself, um, that if you send your money here, it'll actually reach these people doing the work. So I would just literally be plugged in with your actual community um, and see what they need first before I branch out going to different cities. Um, take care of your needs at home, then branch out and get cities. There are definitely funds. Um, there are really cool Twitter threads that have been verified um, of cities and their funds. Um, I can try to find a link and put it in the chat really quick. 
Um, but yeah, that's, that's really my only go-to is just making sure I know the people first before I send anyone else their way. Awesome. Um, that's what I've got for questions. Pretty much everything else has been answered during the discussion. Yeah, we had a question. Let's see. Andre, did you have a question? What's the best? Yeah, yes. I, I don't know if Netta had anything. Um, bail bonds, uh, funds. I've seen a, quite a few. And, you know, just like the, the caller, just like the person said, do you have a, do y'all have a good list on your join campaigns? Yeah, in let's see. Definitely gonna look for a link right now. Okay. Drop it in there. But people are asking where to donate and I've been sending them to some, but I didn't know if they were, um, like you said, doing the right thing or not. <clears throat> okay, so here's Louisville. Mm -hmm. Is this to all and everyone? Okay, I can do this and I'm gonna mute myself, sorry. That was the only other question I saw. Yeah, I thought Atlanta Solidarity Fund, somebody said that, that's the one I sent people to. Awesome. Well, our time is running short, unfortunately. This is such a great conversation. There are so many questions happening. Oh, but I see one for Jill, from Jill, which I need to ask. Um, Jill said, um, and this is our CEO, is there a place where citizens can get information on how to small, start small groups to have conversations about race? Like how to host and how to have these in constructive methods? Oh, well, I might be able to answer that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at, at Equitable Dinners Atlanta, that's what we do. We bring people together to have small group conversation about race and racism. And that is our, our mantra is setting the table for racial equity. We're working with the National Center, the King Center, um, Atlanta Public Schools, the uh, number of other partners that are escaping my mind right now, including the Fulton County Remembrance Coalition. So if you go to equitabledinners.com, we have uh, an event coming up June 14th where we're gonna talk about race, equity, and economics, and we're doing it from a different perspective. We're gonna have the author of The Poverty Industry, Daniel Hatcher, and we are looking at how um, those of poverty are exploited by big business and our governments, actually, uh, and how we're actually making money off the backs of people that we're supposed to be taking care of. And we'll also have Pulitzer Prize winner Jericho Brown joining us for that event um, reciting one of his poems. So if you go to equitabledinners.com, you can register. And uh, please join us to participate as a guest, or we need facilitators for our small group conversations, because every group has a facilitator. Or you can be a virtual host and reach out to our guests who are coming to um, our events. And we are quickly approaching our time, we do see that there are um, other questions in the comments. We can try to answer those afterwards, um, possibly send those out. We'll, some of them, we might be able to put the resources. We will put the resources on our um, Campaign for Equal, Dig Equal Dignity website, um, equaldignity.org. But I just wanted to, to, on behalf of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, I wanted to thank our panelists for joining us today. We are extremely grateful for your time, but most importantly, we are grateful for the work that you do. You. For those of you that are joining us um, online, thank you. We <laughs> realize that within 24 hours of us um, announcing this event, we had over 800 people register. We've had over 500 people participate today in such a vital conversation. We can't thank you enough for spending your time with us. Please continue these conversations in your communities, in your homes. We always like, to, I like to say charity begins at home. For me, it's change begins at home. And these conversations are real. They are uncomfortable, but they are necessary. So for those that are looking to do more with the center, if you would like to join our campaign for equal dignity at equaldignity.org. Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This Friday, I will be back with our CEO, Jill Savitt. We're gonna dive into what the campaign is, what we believe equal dignity is, but we also wanna know what equal dignity means to you. Please stay tuned. We'll be doing much more programming around equal dignity. It is not just for 
um, me, it's not just for you, it's for everyone. It's around health security, it's around economic stability, voting rights, it's around access to quality and equal education. Please join us for these conversations. Thank Along you. with that programming, we have the March Continues, which is Power to Inspire, um, coming soon. A conversation with Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Dennis Mukwege. Please be sure to join us for that. All right. Thank Have you. a great one, everyone. Thank oh, you. Amazing. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be safe. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Thank you.